Okay, so welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing um, the two poor domain potassium channels. Okay, right, so I'm sorry for the abrupt ending to the previous video. I made a ghastly mistake and therefore I had to chop the video up into pieces. Right, so uh, we were discussing the alkaline activated two poor domain potassium channels and I just told you that the K2P5.1 was alkaline activated. Now K2P16.1 and K2P17.1 are also alkaline activated. And then I was just about to tell you that K2P13.1 and K2P12.1 uh, are also alkaline activated, but they're not. That would have been a mistake, okay? So do not underline these ones in turquoise. They are not activated by low proton concentrations. Okay, right, so let's continue discussing the different stimuli which can activate these uh, subunits of two poor domain potassium channels. So there are also the, those uh, two poor domain potassium channel subunits which are activated by calcium. Okay, and there's only one that's activated by intracellular calcium, and this is K2P18.1 or KCNK18.1, well, 18 rather, uh, which we'll see another name for in a moment. Okay, right. Now we're going to talk about uh, the two poor domain potassium channels which are weak. Um, inward rectifiers, and I want to explain to you what is meant by uh, saying that these channels are weak inward rectifiers. So basically, if a potassium channel is an inward rectifier, it means that it prefers to allow potassium to move in than it does to allow potassium to move out. Okay, so Basically, let's think about when potassium would be moving in and out of the cell membrane. So if I draw a little picture here, okay, and I've realized I'm just drawing this picture where I was, was going to write the other names later on, but never mind. Okay, so here is a picture then of our potassium channel. Okay, we know that the intracellular concentration of potassium is around 155 millimolar, whilst the extracellular concentration is 4 millimolar. So, if this channel is weakly inward rectifying, it means that it will prefer to allow potassium to move in and then doesn't really like allowing potassium to move out, basically. Okay, so, when would potassium be moving into the cell? Well, I've already given you the answer to this. It's only if the electrical potential difference across the cell membrane was beyond the Nernst potential for potassium. So remember, the Nernst potential for potassium was negative 85 millivolts. That was the point at which you got no net movement of potassium across the cell membrane. If you went below this, if you went to negative 95 millivolts, say, then you'd get a net movement in. And if you went above this, you'd get a net movement out. So basically, when you take the electrical potential difference across the cell membrane down to negative uh, of the Nernst potential for potassium, these channels are more likely to be open and therefore will conduct potassium ions into the cell. Whereas if you go above the Nernst potential up to, let's say, negative uh, 65, these potassium channels are more likely to be closed and therefore will not conduct potassium channels potassium ions out. So that's how they achieve this uh, inward rectifying state, okay? They block the pore, basically. Uh, well, they're more likely to have a blocked pore when the electrical potential difference across the cell membrane is above the Nernst potential than they are when it's below the Nernst potential, which means that they favor the movement of potassium in rather than out. Okay, right. Uh, so, uh, that's what is meant by weak inward rectifiers. It means that they're more likely to be open and are conducting potassium ions through them when the electrical potential difference across the cell membrane is lower than the Nernst potential for potassium than they are when the electrical potential difference across the cell membrane is above the Nernst potential for potassium. Okay, so, which of these... Um, two poor domain potassium channel subunits then are weak inward rectifiers. Well, firstly, there is the K2P1.1, 
okay? And then there is also the K2P6.1 and the K2P7.1. Okay, so all of those three are weak inward rectifiers. Okay, now, there are also uh, two poor domain potassium channel subunits, which are acid inhibited. Okay, so these will be closed by too high proton concentration. Okay, so we'll highlight these ones in yellow then. Okay, and these are the K2P3.1 subunits, the K2P9.1 subunits, and also the K2P15.1 subunits. Okay, so all of those are inhibited by too high acid concentration. Okay, and then finally, K2P12.1 and K2P13.1 that I tried to say were uh, alkaline activated, these are actually halothane inhibited. Okay, so they're believed to potentially be how general anesthetics work. Okay, uh, well, at least how halothane, the general anesthetic halothane works. Uh, because if you inhibit these channels, then it may well lead to a uh, depolarizing block of the cell membrane. Okay, right, so this is halothane inhibited, basically. Okay, right, uh, so these are the different properties of these different two poor domain potassium channels. Okay, right. So the other thing I just want to discuss before coming on to their other names is the fact that these channel subunits are all going to form dimers, okay? So we've seen that there are these 15 different channel subunits. So the question is, how do they join together to make two poor domain potassium channels? Can they dimerize with other two poor domain potassium channels other than themselves? Well, the answer is there's limited evidence for it. There is evidence that heterodimers do exist, but mainly the sort of dimers you find are homodimers, which means that the two subunits that you dimerize together to make the two poor domain potassium channel will be the same. However, we're getting more and more evidence that heterodimers also exist, which are two poor domain potassium channels, which contain two different uh, subunits, basically. Okay, right. So now let's come on to these other silly names for these uh, two poor uh, domain potassium channel subunits. And the importance of learning these names is that people do actually use these names a lot, basically. Okay, so uh, let's start with the basis for the more all the other silly names, basically, which is the name Twick. Now, I'll get another piece of paper to do this. So, a great, well, a few of these channels are also called Twick channels. So, we want to see what does Twick actually stand for, okay? So, Twick stands for tandem poor domain in a weak inwardly rectifying potassium channel, okay? So, the T stands for tandem poor domain. Now, um, another name for the two poor domain potassium channels is to call them the tandem poor domain potassium channels. Now, tandem just means in sequence, basically. So when you have two things in tandem, it means one follows the other. So these two poor domains, P1 and P2 here, they do follow each other and therefore they are in tandem, basically. So that's where the tandem poor domain portion comes from. And then it's in a weak inwardly rectifying potassium channel. So the T is for tandem poor domain in A, uh, the W is for weak, the I is for inwardly rectifying, and then the K is for the periodic table symbol for potassium. Okay, so this is K plus channel. Okay, so that's what TWIC stands for. So let's now see the um, the channel subunits, which are called TWIC uh, channels then. Okay, so there are two of these that are named TWIC channels. Okay, so K2P1.1, also called KCNK1, is called TWIC1. Okay, so this is TWIC1. And then we also have TWIC2, which is at K2P6.1 down here. 
Okay. In addition, uh, K2P 7.1 would also be considered in a family with TWIC1 and TWIC2, but it's not given the name TWIC3. Okay. There's very little evidence yet that K2P 7.1 is even expressed at all. You have the gene for it, but whether it's actually expressed is still debatable. Okay, right. Uh, so, the next silly name then, uh, and people do use these names, which is why we need to know them. Okay, so the next thing is the TREC proteins, okay, or the TREC subunits. So, TREC stands for TWIC related potassium channel. So, the T is for TWIC, okay, the R is then for related. Okay, uh, and the E is also for related, so the RE is for related, and then the K is then for potassium channel. So we now want to see which of these um, two poor domain potassium channel subunits are known as tracks. Okay, so firstly, the most heavily studied of all the two poor domain potassium channels is a track channel. Okay, so K2P2.1 is called TREC1, okay? And this one is easily the most studied of all of the potassium channels, okay? There is then also a TREC2 channel, okay? And this is K2P10.1. So K2P10.1 is also called TREC2. Okay, right, on to the next silly name then. Okay, so the next silly name is TASC. Okay, so some of these two poor domain potassium channels are going to be called TASCs. And TASC stands for a TWIC related acid sensitive potassium channel. Okay, so the T is for TWIC related. Okay, and that's going to be a running theme that all the T's are going to stand for TWIC related rather. And then the A is for acid, the S is for sensitive, and then the K is for potassium channel. So these are the TWIC-related acid-sensitive potassium channels. Okay, or the TASCs. So uh, let's see which of the uh, two poor domain potassium channels are actually called TASCs then. Okay, so uh, firstly we start off with K2P3.1. 